My name is Jean-Michel Chapon. I work for the DigiWorld Institute, we are a digital think tank. And this morning, I'm going to talk about big data and privacy, and more specifically on the trust that uh, telco have with the consumers and how they should manage this. Good morning. My name is Sonia Asse, and I work for DigiWorld Institute. I'm the business developer. This morning, we will be talking about the responsibility that telcos have on the data that we receive and the huge opportunity that we are all living in. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> Bonjour. Let me introduce you to Sonia Asté, and she's not Paul Newman. <laughs> and let me introduce to you Jean-Michel Chapon, and he is clearly not Robert Redford. Clearly not. Thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, regardless of the, for those of you who are wondering if you have walked into the wrong room, don't worry, this is not cinema club. Uh, but as we were working on this presentation, Jean-Michel and I sort of wondered and realized how much big data resembles a huge blockbuster movie. I mean, it has everything. It has drama. Uh, Richard, has, Richard has told us it has drama, intrigue, romance, plots, turns, everything. If, if you look at it, some of the, the information we were given already. And I guess the question this morning was, is Big Data Blockbuster going to be a huge success like The Sting? Or is it going to be a big flop? like Jaws 8. This is what we're going to be looking at this morning. And in true cinema, cinema style, I'll say scene one, take one, take it away, Jean-Michel. Thank you very much, Sonia. Well, I believe that big data is very much like a, a gold rush, luck in 1850. And luck in 1850, not uh, we had a few, a handful of, of people basically digging for gold, and we had a, either they were making money out of looking for the gold, striking gold, or selling the tools to them. Guns, tanks, horses, and I'm saying this because we're consultants, okay? <laughs> but they were very much looking, either they had a choice. And do not forget that not everybody strikes gold, but we had a full ecosystem out of it. A handful of people, or thousands of people in 1850, were looking for it, and there was an entire city making a living out of those, from saloon to, and so on. It's a little bit what, about what Richard was saying, that some people are going to be going for the gold or be prospectors, others are going to be selling the tools, and some of us are going to be doing both. But uh, before we continue, um, I really want to see how big this is. I mean, how big of a data has to be gold the gold digital. rush. digital, yes. How big is it, Jean-Michel? Well, the, the gold rush is going to be substantial. I mean, if we look at our telecom economy of a whole, when we grow, we grow about 3 and 4% per year. So it's not very much a killer. It's all to do about more with less and so on. If we look at a segment of big data on its own, the average growth rate per year is 47%. This is going to reach about nearly $60 billion by 2016. I'm sure that... Just, just like me, you can't relate to what $60 billion is. No. Well, $60 billion, <laughs> it can be 10 times what uh, the value of uh, Blackberry's been a few days ago, yeah. <laughs> as an example. It could be as well, if you were deploying optical fiber to more than half of the single homes in the UK, that's a lot of digging, that's about that, that amount of our money. So basically, we all want to be part, part of this. Yeah, I mean, definitely, we want to be part of it. Um, but who else is involved in this? We've seen some of the examples, but who are the main players of this well, plot? We have actually quite a good cast on, uh, on, on this film. The first player I would like to introduce you to is the European Commission. As you know, they have trying, been trying to set fair rules for everybody, as they have done recently with roaming data. I don't know if you've seen them I in the uh, European Commission. You, you set up a blog just on the, uh, the new package we came out. Uh, on roaming, they want to eradicate it completely in the next two years so that when we go abroad, we don't have a massive bill. So that's, that's one of them. That's one of the, of the key players. And, and the other one, I think, is uh, the other 
key actor is the banks and the retailers who have our information, are definitely selling our information, and also using our information. Just as an example, who here uh, banks with Barclays Bank? No shame in that, I bark with, with them. Uh, there's 13 million of us. And as of the 9th of October, they have announced that they're going to be selling our information. Now, I have not received a letter informing me th of this. I don't even know how to opt out. So I don't think that's, that's really fair. Uh, I'm not talking, what do you? Well, you don't have to worry too much about it, Sonia, because actually we have a very group of people looking after those interests. We have the data agencies like the ICOs. We also have uh, Witch Magazine, who launched a campaign a few weeks ago, if you remember that. And we also have somebody called like Big Border Watch, which is remember, as his name says, is defending civil liberties and protecting privacy. We're talking about privacy. So those people are looking very much after those. So you don't have to, to worry too much about it. And let's not forget the uninvited guest. Of course, you, I'm, I'm referring here to the, to the whistleblower, the Edward Snowden. As Richard mentioned earlier, we, there's various opinions about, about Richard, but uh, sorry, Edward Snowden. <laughs> Positive <laughs> or, or only get it it's on good, Snowden, it's good. not on you. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe uh, we don't know. But uh, regardless of what people think about, about Snowden, there's one thing we cannot deny. He definitely made a massive awareness of what big data is all about, what the government can do with the data. And whatever uh, the NSA had to defend and, and to make their case and to negotiate and, and lobby, whatever happened to them, you just don't want your organization to go for this. So you have to be mindful about, about the ways you as well. Okay, but I'm going to put my hand up again because there are, yes, there is a hype, there is growth, but there are other areas that are also growing. I mean, what makes this area so different? What makes this area, what, what is the hook that has us in this space uh, looking forward to it? Well, the hook is very, very simple. The hook is that with big data and the right analysis, as, as Richard mentioned earlier, we can predict customer behavior. I mean, we've seen the hype of the cycle. This is very much the uh, holy grail that everybody is after. If we have the right analysis, we can predict customer. Let me give you an example. Uh, who here has ever considered changing their mobile operator? I mean, it happened to me, quite a few of us. Right, it happened to me two weeks ago. I called uh, Orange, or EE as they call now, because, you know, as I called them, you hear the automated voice tells you, if you want to leave Orange, press number four. Simple. But don't you think it would have been much better if they were able to call me before I called them, mm. before I start to think about uh, leaving them? Yeah, I mean, that would have been wonderful because as we know in, in the telco world, churn is really the number one enemy. And how we prevent that? Well, good customer experience. But wouldn't it be fantastic if we could actually predict when the customer is going to get annoyed before he presses on the number four? That, that would be fantastic. So going back to this example, what happened very much is why I was upset is that they could have find out that I was about to call them. They had all the data, all the information about it. They knew that my calls were dropping, even when I was calling from home, not moving, not head over between cells. They knew that my phone was getting hot and confused between Wi-Fi and 3G. They, had, they knew that because they could see that from the network. And I called them three times in the previous months on 150, technical support, to complain about it. So very much, there was not much rocket science on finding out between my pattern and anybody else who had left them before, they could have found out, basically, and they could yes. have called me before. And is that what we're for referring to as metadata? Exactly, this is very much using the metadata. It was not about reading my Twitters or my Facebook, if I could complain about it, because, you know, I'm a telco consultant, I wouldn't complain on Facebook about Orange, would I? I mean, it's not suicide. But they could have found out that there was something not working very much. And I think uh, taking your, your example, which is very familiar to us, I think that our phones are fast becoming a data magnet. Uh, whenever we use it with a contact list or retailers, um, I would argue that the telco world will have more information than anybody else. And with this information that we hold, there comes a big responsibility and we enter that scary arena of trust. Trust is a big, big word. 
big world indeed, actually. Just to really trace how each of us can relate to this. I would like to each of you think of a company that you trust. Think of a second of a company you trust. Difficult, but. <laughs> you have a thought? Was it Google? No. I don't think so. <laughs> Was it Facebook? No. Neither. Was it your bank? I'm not so sure anymore. So I would like to say that we, and uh, to bounce back actually to what, what Richard said earlier, that the telco have more trust than many of the other players in this arena. So I think far. we've got to look at this. So far. Now, we, uh, again, as we were preparing this, we took loads of ideas about what trust was, uh, debated it, uh, turned it around. At the end, we decided on one quote that I think summarizes what trust is. And do we have it? Yes. <laughs> so basically, easy, uh, difficult to get, easy to lose. Uh, is this correct? And how do we maintain this trust? Well, maintaining this trust is very much to, uh, the first step. It's quite difficult to maintain the trust, but the first step is sticking to the rules. And there's some basic things to, to think about. So the rules uh, are, quite, uh, are quite complex. As you can see, there's, uh, there's, uh, and they keep changing as well. This one came on the 25th of August 2013. It'll be a month tomorrow. And this is enforceable now. And what did it say? Well, it says, uh, I have to read it because it's, it's quite, a, uh, quite a complicated one. Uh, where do I put this? From 25th of August 2013, all EU telecom operators and internet service providers are required to notify authorities of any theft, loss, Unauthorized access to personal data, including email, calling data, IP addresses, and... Let me stop you right there. I'm okay. sure you've just lost all the crowd, including yeah. me. Yes, okay. so can you give us, preferably, an example of what we're supposed to be doing? Okay, let's take an example. Let's move on and, and move to another operator. Let's move to Germany and let's move to Vodafone. Okay. Let's imagine a minute that I'm a customer of Vodafone in Germany. And they have my data. And let's imagine they get hacked. I know it's a bit stretch of imagination, so I will, I will, I will, I will help you a bit, uh, because actually that happened uh, two weeks ago. They got hacked for two million of bank detail of their customers. Wow. Even in Germany. Um, <laughs> from that, what they had to do, they had 24 hours to inform the Benetza, the regulator. They had to tell them what happened, why it happened, what are the consequences of it. Mm -hmm. That's day one. Day three, three days later, not much time, they have to publish what they're going to do about it, what measures they're going to implement to address the consequences. And, the fun bit, they have to inform every single of the customer that could be impacted by that, and what was the consequences, and we were doing it to protect their privacy, and so on. And did they do that? Well, they're German. They yeah, did. of course. <laughs> so can you explain it in a diagram kind of thing? Uh, so yes, that yes. it's really clear? Uh, just to clear it under the legal text, you have a data breach, one day to report to the authority, what happened, why happened, what are the consequences. Day three, report what you're going to do about it and inform the customers. And this is the law since month's time. Okay, and let me give another example. What if Vodafone had sold their information to a third party, like Audi, for example, and Audi had been hacked. What would have happened here? Well, if Audi bought the data because they want to do a smart marketing campaign, for example, and they lose the data, well, they've got, they don't have a relationship with Vodafone customers. So what they've got to do is to inform Vodafone. And once Vodafone hear from Audi that they had the breach and, and leak, they're back to square one. Mm -hmm. The breach from the third party is exactly like it was theirs. We go back through the loop. Vodafone, who sold the data to Audi and Audi had a hack or loss, had to inform the Benetza, and then three days later, had to communicate to all of their customers that they sold the data to Audi and Audi messed up. Do you have that in the diagram? Just uh, yes, yes we do. It goes like this. If you have a breach. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. <laughs> it's exactly as if it was yours. Okay, so I think this is a huge, huge and very important part. 
once the data reaches us, it's our responsibility forever. It's, it's sort of like when you have a child, you know, you have it and it's your responsibility forever. Yeah, I, I think with the child it's slightly different because I've been told that uh, when they're 18, we eventually they leave home. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> some of them. But the data response, it doesn't stay okay. with you. Okay, <laughs> so, um, so this, is, this is a big thing. I mean, three days to react, etc. Is there any way that we can minimize the risk of yes. this? Yes, and actually there's two ways to can minimize the risk. The first one is to encrypt the data. So if you go back to the example of Audi, because they call Audi, what do they think? Well, von Schrundorf technique, obviously. And what they did, they engineered the data to encrypt it. That's the first thing. And when they lose the data, when they get hacked, because the data is encrypted, they don't have to report it. Because the data, once it's becoming uh, sorry, for a Frenchman, that's a nice one. In intelligible, a lot of training on in intelligible. Once the data is unintelligible, can I manage that one? Unintelligible. Unintelligible. Okay. It doesn't matter so much. It's just that actually the data is not being full to anyone else, therefore you don't have to report it. That's the first step. Okay, and what's, and what's this? You mentioned two. Uh, yeah, what's the, the second, second one? Step, obviously, is to anonymize the data. Uh, sorry, anonymize the data? Yeah, that's another okay. nice one, especially yeah. for Frenchmen who speak English. Anonymize the anonymize the yeah, data using the data in anonymous fashion. Okay? okay. And can you give us don't read anything out, can you give us an example which is we can understand a little bit better? Um, yeah, I think I've got an example here can apply to uh, most of us or so soon will who here has a, a set top box? A TV, uh, TV set top box. Set top box. Well, I've got yeah. one. Okay. And uh, <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing because in public here, but I've got to confess that um, Every Sunday night, I have a, a special moment. A what? A special moment. A special moment. A special moment, yes. Okay. Every Sunday night, uh, I've got a special moment when uh, I watch Top Gear. <laughs> and I guess uh, a few of you also watch Top Gear on Sunday night. And actually, your neighbor's also watching Top Gear, because my neighbor is watching it as well. He, I know he, he told me. He confessed as well. Uh, and, and suddenly, you got an ad coming up. An advert? An advert. Okay. An advert. An advert for you get an advert for Ferrari, Top Gear Ferrari. Well, your neighbor, at the same time, on the same channel, get an advert for Fiat. <laughs> yes. <gasps> what I'm saying here is that they have enough data to give you the ad for the car you deserve and for the car your neighbor deserves. <laughs> <laughs> This is Jean-Michel, and is this happening now? I mean, is this, sun, this, this, real, is this a real example? Is this happening now? And who's, go, who's doing this? Well, Give us the scoop. Okay, this is not happening right now yet, because I'm sure you haven't seen many Ferraris advertised on your top gear. But actually, it's going to happen in a couple of months. Uh, that's for sure. And no, Sonia, I can't tell you who's that. Sorry. Not really There's only three, so no? no okay, <laughs> we'll leave it, we'll leave it. So um, you, you've talked about encryption. Uh, we've talked about anonymizing the, the data. data. Yes. Um, Shall we summarize that? Yes. So if you, uh, if you have your bridge, you go through this loop. If you encrypt the data or anonymize the data, as Richard mentioned earlier, you don't have to go through the loop. The law says that if the data is inintelligible, or if you use the data is not being to anyone, you can't trace back to the individual you don't have to inform. So that's very much the, the, best, the best practice. And that's why we believe the, the, way, the way to do it. You're still not going to tell us who's doing the ad? No, okay. no, I think, I think now, Sonia, no, you, you won't talk to me. I won't, I won't tell you anything on this. I think it's about, uh, oops, we're missing a slide. It's about to conclude. Uh, and I want to, things I want you to remember from what we've seen uh, this morning. We've got to read three things. The first of all is, as telco, you have to, I mean, we know there's a big, big same it's growing, but you very much have to consider the trust, trust of your, of your customers. And that's a, a very intangible thing. There's ranking who comes on, on a regular basis on which company we trust, which we don't, but you have to, to, look, to, be, uh, to be mindful of this. The second point is the law on this keep changing. What we've shown you came into force on the 25th of August. The month tomorrow. I don't know how many of you were aware of this, but this is actually active. It's happening now. So you need to be mindful of that. And that's the best way, or at least the first step, to maintain the trust. The, the third point uh, we've covered is basically, in terms of best practice, 
do consider anonymizing and encrypting the data, as actually Richard mentioned earlier. Uh, that also implies another thing. It implies that you have a data governance across, across the company, so that you aren't actually not on your own with this responsibility on your shoulders. You very much need to get the data governance in your, in your business. And, and, and the last point, the last point which escaped to me, uh, which is actually the most important of this stuff, is that the responsibility is yours. Even if you sell the data, pass it on to someone else, you can't walk away from that. If you pass your partner, you didn't choose your partner wisely, then you're going to have the responsibility of informing your customers. So the, the, the key point here is that the data the responsibility doesn't work, work, choose your partner wisely. And the best way actually to, to do more business on, on these terms. Okay, so um, I, I want to actually finish by going back to the movie. Uh, how many of you have watched The Sting? Yeah, everybody, we love it, we love it. And at, at the end of the movie, the uh, Paul Newman, you have to love too, uh, asks Robert Redford why he's not staying around to get his share of the money. And Robert Redford says, I'm not because I would only blow it. So I invite us in this room to not blow this fantastic opportunity we have and to make a big data blockbuster the best movie ever. Thank you very much. And music. music. I think it's a coffee break now. Jean-Michel, so, yeah. so what is the fine if you don't comply with the day one and the day three? Uh, I don't know. I haven't, uh, this, the, 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 the text, text of the law doesn't specify what's the penalty, basically. To right. I remember it was something like up to 5% or 10% of the uh, Oh Yes, yes. There was, uh, that's the law was supposed to be, uh, it's very interesting because the dynamic here changed with Snowden. Initially, the, what was started um, last year in October, the uh, um, Cross, the, the um, person in charge of the DG13 information, wanted to have something says anybody who contravene and uh, um, jeopardize the privacy of an individual will have a fine of 2% of their revenue. Um, obviously, as soon as that came out, there was plenty of, of lobby, uh, <laughs> you can imagine, from many people. And uh, just to illustrate that, okay, if I was customer of Vodafone <laughs> and they lose my data, it means a fine of a billion dollars. Yeah. Uh, it's 2%. They do 48, 49 billion uh, revenue. Uh, with all the lobbying, there was thing that was diluting, diluting, and the European Commission was losing ground because the lobbyists were winning ground. And what happened then? Prims and was Snowden. Sorry? Prims and, and Snowden came out <laughs> just at the right time. So what happened, the dynamic between the European Commission and, and, uh, and the players is that uh, European Commission says, well, look, guys, we can't trust you. We know we can't trust you because, look, you've been selling all your data to anyone else. So don't give me this argument about that. And actually, they, they postponed slightly the law. But in the meantime, that helped them to bring the one I just mentioned earlier. So that's what happened. So yeah, the, the sanction is still... Like 50, who cares? No, no, no. Cares. no that's, why, that's why they went for 2% for of the revenue. But that's not yet voted. And it's still, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are very active in Brussels to, to manage that one. How about when the government uses your data? <laughs> well, they have to inform the authority. But actually, the, the law we read is applied to internet service providers and telco. Step one. We will see how that's devolved and how it goes around. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>